I'm very pleased to be able to to do this because it's been a while since we did uh, a Q&A session and uh, quite a few people that had uh, some interesting questions. So we're going to go through that. But before we do that, let's start with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can come and um, look into your word, look into world events, shake our hands and see that your word is alive, your word is true. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word is uh, purifying us. And uh, it is truth. And uh, we can only let truth purify us. And your word is truth. So we thank you, Father. And we ask that uh, this coming hour will glorify your name and will bring us closer to you. And we ask this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, the hope of Israel and the light of revelation to the Gentiles. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. So, Shalom again, everyone. This is Amir Tzalfati, and we are about to start a short update, followed by a Q&A session. I know that I gave an important update on uh, Facebook and of later on was uploaded on our YouTube channel. We talked about um, the election in Russia and how I believe that this term of Putin is definitely a term where the demon of Gog will dwell in him to fulfill that which he intends to, to do. Um, and I do believe with all of my heart that uh, Russia is right now positioning itself in a way that um, um, it has problems with Europe, it has problems with America, it has problems with almost most of the world. Um, and the only allies that the Rus Russians are finding right now are the allies that will stick with it all the way through the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. Very interesting. Um, we also, um, we, we just were exposed in the last 48 hours to publications that um, it is no longer a secret, it is no longer in the shadow. Israel officially um, admits that in September of 2007, eight of its um, fighter jets, four F-15s and four F-16s, attacked the Syrian nuclear reactor at Deir Azur in the desert. It's a North Korean reactor that was built by the North Koreans. Um, and for the longest time, um, we, we thought, or at least they declared, it's a research center for agricultural purposes. And uh, after we uh, sent uh, Mossad agents to borrow the laptop of the head of the nuclear energy agency of Syria, who was a guest in one of the conferences in Europe, and after we retrieved all the information from his computer, um, we decided to send some um, Israeli commander units to the ground. It took them uh, more than 24 hours of walking from the place where they were uh, landed by the uh, CH-53s, the uh, big helicopters. And after a long walk, they collected some samples of the soil. And that, of course, was the stamp of approval for the Israelis that indeed a uranium um, reactor is uh, being, um, is being uh, dealt with over there. Israel revealed the information to President Bush at the time and Condoleezza Rice at the time. Believe it or not, but the Americans told us in July of 2007 that are not, they are not willing to participate or to initiate any, any attack uh, in Syria. Um, literally leaving us all alone. Israel said that... Uh, it's ready to do it by herself. And uh, on the very first week of September of 2007, um, close to 1 a.m., we launched 
the attack uh, didn't la uh, didn't last for too long and the nuclear reactor the north korean nuclear reactor in the desert of syria was instantly destroyed leaving the syrians shocked the beautiful thing was that the syrians never admitted that they had it we never admitted that we destroyed it and therefore it was a done deal the Assad allowed some weapon inspectors to go there and to prove that there was nothing and in fact when they collected samples there they actually confirmed that, that there were traces of uranium over there so uh, it didn't make him look good the problem is that we suspect that there is another one in fact we suspect that there is an underground facility in the town of Qusair which is 100 miles north of Damascus on the Lebanese-Syrian border. And um, we, we not only believe there is something going on there, we know that at least 800 um, of the cooling devices, um, cooling rods um, that were supposed to go to the Deir Azur reactor were taken to that place. And uh, the amount of energy that we know that is being used over there the um, construction and the cam camouflaging of everything over there leaves no doubt that something fishy is going on there. And um, I believe that there, one of the reasons Israel admitted that it destroyed the first reactor is because Israel is basically telling the world, we will not tolerate any nuclear weapon in the hands of our enemies. Um, and should Iran has it, we will attack. Should Syria work on a new one, we will attack. It's not even an if, it is just when. And um, I'm just finding it very, very interesting uh, that this is the, the situation. Um, another interesting news is that um, the um, Air India flight um, Air India flight from New Delhi all the way to to Tel Aviv um, the first flight ever uh, just took off uh, hours ago from New Delhi and we're talking about AI-139 that's the flight number Air India 139 for the first time in 70 years of existence of Israel a direct flight commercial flight from any country flies in Saudi airspace without a problem. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about the fact that there's a warming up in the relationship between the Israelis and the Saudis, that the Saudis actually collaborate with the Israelis right now, and the target, of course, is let's, let's deal with Iran together. Um, for the first time in 70 years of existence of Israel, a commercial airliner flying to Tel Aviv was allowed to fly in Saudi airspace. The flight actually is about to land in 20 minutes. And uh, again, we are talking about the first ever commercial flight from any destination to Tel Aviv to fly above Saudi airspace. This is incredible and historic in any shape or form. And, um, and I believe this is amazing. <clears throat> Another historic thing was that U.S. Congress today passed um, a, um, a bill known as the Taylor Force Act. The Taylor Force Act was named after Taylor Force, who was, a, um, he was a, an American ex or veteran who was in Tel Aviv. I think he was Special Forces. Um, he was in Tel Aviv for other reasons, and a Palestinian terrorist killed him. And um, his family sued the Palestinian Authority and forced the U.S. government to hold or withdraw or withhold all, um, all of the um, financial aid to the Palestinian Authority uh, in case they are funding or continue to fund terrorist uh, families. Um, basically... Um, um, we're talking about 400 
and 50 million shekels that they pay to terrorists every every month. It's over $100 million um, that they pay every month to terrorists and terrorist families. And um, what the American uh, Congress basically um, uh, said is we will not support the Palestinian Authority until they stop funding terrorist families because this is a reward of course and uh, if you don't have money you just go you blow yourself up and kill as many as possible and your family will enjoy good money um, <clears throat> so um, so we're talking about a very very interesting thing that uh, just happened today Senator Lindsey Graham was the one who's been working on it for the last two years and today Congress passed the bill the Taylor Force Act and the Palestinian Authority is now officially broke. Um, you try to destroy Israel, you try to attack Israel, you try to deny Israel's right to exist, and uh, probably that's what you get. Um, I believe that there is no way you can talk peace on one hand, and on the other hand, encourage terrorism by paying terrorist families hundreds of millions of dollars. That doesn't work. Um, that only encourages terrorism. And um, I wonder if uh, any country um, who would um, encourage uh, people to blow themselves up and then pay their families hundreds of millions of dollars, I, I wonder if any, any country like that would be accepted in the UN as a, an honorable one. But the Palestinians enjoyed uh, the, the blind eye that was turned from the rest of the world. They were spoiled by the Obama administration who, who really demanded nothing from them. And a new sheriff is in town right now. And President Donald Trump says enough is enough. Um, the Palestinian president in his first meeting with Donald Trump um, told him that that doesn't happen. He doesn't pay any terrorists. And when President Trump found out that that was a lie during his visit to Israel, he was just furious at the Palestinian president. He said, you deceived me in my own office and we will not work with you as long as you fund terrorism. And so this is uh, what we have right now. Every attempt to destroy Israel by the Palestinians for the last 70 years has failed and this one is a colossal failure. Now the Palestinians better uh, get their act together and understand that um, it's only getting worse. It starts with recognition of Jerusalem as capital, it's, it continues with the moving of the embassy two months from now and ends up with uh, cutting all funds to ta Palestinian uh, uh, Authority and they better uh, understand that um, their whining and crying to the international community won't really help. Their biggest supporters, Saudi Arabia, stopped supporting them. The biggest supporters from other uh, moderate Sunni countries no longer support them. Egypt and Jordan understand that the Palestinians are double dipping. On one hand, they are saying peace. On the other hand, they're encouraging terrorism. And they're not really helping him and them. And so we, we see a very frustrated Palestinian Authority right now in Maybe uh, things will change, I'm not sure. All I know that Israel doesn't have to worry about the Palestinians. If anything, we need to worry about a, a possible nuclear reactor being built in Syria. We need to worry about the Iranians trying to break the delicate um, balance of power in the Middle East. And uh, we need to worry that uh, President Putin... Uh, enjoying almost 75% uh, support in his country in over the last elections will just do whatever he wants in the Middle East. Uh, it's quite uh, interesting. Now, quite a few people asked me, Amir, you've been talking about a possible American strike in Syria and what, what's going on there? Well, about um, less than 48 hours ago, I, I reported um, it wasn't a live report on video, but it was a written one on my Facebook that um, the Americans right now are literally controlling the um, eastern flank of the Euphrates River. They're right here on the eastern side, then the, the, the Euphrates is running, and then right here are the Syrian soldiers, uh, Hezbollah, 
and the Russians on this side. But the, the thing is that uh, of the f uh, four biggest oil fields of Syria, three are on this side, already controlled by the Americans. And the second largest one, T2, is west of the Euphrates. And it was just taken in the last 48 hours by ISIS. Believe it or not, we thought ISIS is gone. ISIS is not gone. ISIS resurrected itself. They, they regrouped and they came back and in a very smart, deadly attack, they detonated four car bombs. They killed 23 soldiers on the ground and they took over T2 and literally stopped the supply of most of the oil to the rest of Western Syria and even to the air bases of the Russians over there. And right now, America is bringing troops all the way from Iraq, whatever they had, tanks and rockets uh, launchers and, and um, armored vehicles, but also uh, some uh, bridges that are, are they're launched uh, by a armored vehicles. Um, and all of those are telling everyone around that the American um, um, backed forces are planning an invasion to the western flank of the Euphrates in order to take over T2. This is incredible. Um, the Russians are so frustrated with that because the Russians are trying to get some dividends from all of their um, activity in Syria and they just they get all the casualties but they don't get uh, they don't get the the prize they don't get the oil they don't get the gas and um, they're very frustrated right now um, <clears throat> so this is more or less what I wanted to talk about as far as an update um, and I think we're going to move right now to the questions and answers um, portion of it. Um, the first question that people ask me is, um, so Russia says it will retaliate any kind of Israeli attack in Syria with nuclear slash chemical weapons. Do you see this as the time that God will intervene and Israel will be protected from such attack? First of all, the Russians talked about nuclear and chemical only as a response, if anything, to an American nuclear uh, strike or the balance that they're trying to, to uh, propose is not Israeli, but it's actually um, American um, Russian balance. However, if one reads carefully the description of Ezekiel's war, especially the one in the 39th chapter, there is no doubt that an unconventional weapon uh, is going to be used in that war. It's going to be a short but very deadly uh, 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 war. And uh, if you ask me if, if God will intervene, that's what the Bible says. The, the Bible is clearly indicating that the Lord God of Israel will basically humble them. The Bible says um, um, that they try to come uh, against his people. Um, and um, um, the Bible says that uh, in verse 19, he says, uh, for in my jealousy and in, in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the beast of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall throw down. And it speaks of how um, he, he basically will... Um, uh, destroy them. He says in verse 22, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed and I will and I will rain down on him, on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great uh, hailstorm fire and brimstone. 
Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations that they shall know that I am the Lord. And even in, in the beginning of chapter 39, I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you again against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow, the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. So there's no doubt there is a supernatural godly intervention in the whole affair of Ezekiel's war. Another question is, we know that the U.S. is working with Israel now and would be involved in any kind of defensive strike right now. Could this be when God intervenes even though the U.S. is or would be helping Israel? This is a tricky one. Uh, of course, the tricky question is, if America is so strong right now, I mean, it's such a big ally of Israel right now, how come America is not helping Israel in Ezekiel's war now? Um, that is where we suspect that there is a very, very good chance that America will no longer be a superpower at the time of the Ezekiel's war. Um, and one must uh, ask himself, okay, what are the options for America not to be um, anymore a superpower? Uh, there are several scenarios. One is financial collapse, when the other one is a war. I'm not really foreseeing a war with North Korea, but a war with Russia could be more likely. However, um, the one option that I prefer to think as the most realistic one is the rapture of the church that might cause the uh, vast uh, portion of the American administration and uh, key positions in America's government to completely become vacant and the country will experience a significant collapse. Um, again, these are all speculations. I prefer, I follow a teaching of my good spiritual father, Chuck Smith, where the Bible is silent, we better be silent. How do we know that the Ezekiel 38 passage is, suppo is supposed to be immediately before the rapture tribulation, God helped Israel through several other wars which were not immediately before the rapture. That's true, but there's only one problem. Um, during the um, other wars that God helped Israel, Russia, Iran, and Turkey were not at the border of Israel. They were not even in any alliance. Ezekiel's war is around the corner, not only because what Ezekiel wrote, it's because everything he wrote is already coming to pass before our very eyes. So, you, you know, we see things happening around us. We see what the Bible says. We make one in one, and, and we understand that uh, that war is around the corner. Now, um, <clears throat> people... Uh, to your question, if it's supposed to be immediately before the rapture, it could be actually right after the rapture. It could be that the rapture will cause America to collapse and then Russia to make its move. So I'm not dogmatic on Ezekiel being after or before. I'm just saying the possibility of America not being there uh, because of uh, political reasons is very, very unlikely. Um, most likely, I, 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 I see something of, of, a, of a catastrophic nature that will happen to America, whether it's a war, natural disaster, financial collapse, or the rapture, it's for you to decide. But the fact of the matter is that America is not going to help Israel militarily in the Ezekiel account, at least not according to the account of Ezekiel. We don't see any war um, description there that involves other nations helping Israel. In, and it's just so God will get all the honor and the glory. There is a word with some of my trusted news sites that the peace plan will not be presented until Abbas is out of office. Have you heard or know anything about that. 
Well, um, I think both the Israelis and uh, the Americans know that Abbas has uh, some serious uh, cancer and he's battling cancer right now. Uh, the problem is that we, we really don't see anyone that can replace him who can be someone that will um, take upon himself the mantle of bringing peace. Um, the Palestinians, uh, for the longest time, at least the last 70 years, said no to every peace plan, and not because they don't want peace. It's because the cost of that peace is unbearable for them. Um, they cannot envision themselves uh, declaring that two-thirds of uh, the country they claim that is theirs will not be theirs. And not only that, they also have obligation for the millions of Palestinian refugees who demand to um, come into Israel and not to their territories. And they will not get that in any peace plan. So I really do not foresee a Palestinian-Israeli peace um, that stands by itself. If anything, the ultimate deal is that the Palestinians will be forced to agree to something that is much bigger than just them. It is bigger because it will involve the large Arab nations such as Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Adding to them is Egypt and Jordan, and you're already in a very small minority. Are we coming to the end of the times of the Gentiles and what are the implications of this? I believe we do. I believe that um, the times of the Gentiles are the times that God has opened the doors primarily as a result of the um, rejection of Israel of the Messiah. God opened the door for the Gentiles. And I believe that for the last 2,000 years, Gentiles had the chance to accept the Lord. Um, and um, so we see two things. We see one, the, the Gentiles that uh, control the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And so that is more of a, on the negative connotation. And the other part is we see that the door was open to the Gentiles um, uh, to receive the gospel. Um, and that is what Romans 11 says, that, uh, um, that first it has to come, that uh, the, time of the, angel has to, the times of the Gentiles have to come in, and then all Israel will be saved. Well, that is changing, of course. We, we see that Israel is gaining control over its land and over its city, and, uh, and um, we also see that um, eventually the door to the Gentiles will be closed, and now God will shift his attention back to Israel. Um, so, so basically the rapture of the church could be the last moment Gentiles as a whole can freely, openly accept the Lord. You Think about who's going to be left behind. It's all the Gentiles who did not believe, who rejected the Messiah who said, it is not for us. Now, probably you're going to tell me, wait a minute, but Israel rejected him too. Yes, but the difference between Israel and the Gentiles, at least according to Romans 11, is that Israel is the only nation that God blinded and not Satan. The Bible says that God gave them eyes that they cannot hear, see and ears that they cannot hear, a spirit of stupor. Um, and, and it's the same God who, because of his love to the whole world and seeing the stubbornness and the stiff-necked uh, 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 nature of Israel blinded them, so the nations of the world will accept him. But the moment will come when that's going to come to an end and the door is going to shut down, off or and then and, and God is going to deal with Israel right now. And these are the seven years of uh, the tribulation. In fact, I believe that the first three and a half years will be a years of trial, and the last three and a half years will, will be Jacob's trouble, will be a tremendous, uh, uh, troublesome time that will come upon the Jewish people about Israel that will eventually lead them to accept the Messiah. And I know that it is hard to hear that. I know that it is something that even a lot of 
believers, uh, Jewish believers, uh, find it very, very strange. But, but the Bible is clearly indicating that, uh, first, God is not through with Israel. Second, there will be a great suffering as a result of the rejection of the Messiah. And third, as you read in Zechariah 13, two-thirds of Israel will perish, and the last third, God is going to bring through the fire uh, and refine them. So, um, I believe that all of Israel, the Bible says, will be saved, but uh, two-thirds of them will ha- will perish first, and, and it's the last third that will survive physically the tribulation and be there when the Messiah is returning. Um, Regarding the 144,000 in Revelation, are they going to remain slash preach only in Israel or go out into the Gentile world? Well, um, as I said, I believe that those seven years will be God dealing primarily with Israel. Um, Doesn't mean that they're physically in Israel, they could be around the world, but ministering to Jewish people. Let me let me explain something. Now it's the times of the Gentiles. Yet some Jews accept Christ, such as myself. Then there will come the time of the Jews, and I believe that some Gentiles will, of course, be saved. But as a whole, right now, it's the time of what you guys call the church. Church era for the most part, comprise mostly of Gentile people. But God is, you know, lifting the veil uh, of several Jewish people, even, you know, throughout this time. Um, And I do believe with all of my heart that the last seven years, once the rapture takes place, um, I believe that the shift is moving back to Israel. And after 2,000 years of possibility for Gentiles to accept Christ, those who will be left behind will be those who are blinded completely by the Antichrist, by Satan. And these are the people that uh, Revelation 16 is saying that um, even though they know that God has the power to stop all those plagues, uh, the Bible says, um, I'm reading in verse 10 of Revelation 16, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scourge men with fire and men were scourged with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. So we see um, a great, great abomination and we see great rebellion we see that there's no hardly anyone left um, from among the Gentiles to um, to receive Christ at uh, the the time so again we we see that uh, happening and um, the people are just going to be completely completely uh, um, Blind. It, it even says, um, then uh, in um, in, in in earlier than that, uh, I just read from verse ten. But even verse nine, and men were scourged with great heat. They blasphemed and did not give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom become became full of darkness, and they not their tongues because of the pain they blasphemed the god of heaven because of their pain and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds so you see complete spiritual blindness at the time well if the rapture is going to happen ahead of the tribulation talked about in the book of revelation are the detailed events given for the benefit of those left behind, including the nation of Israel? Look, God, by His grace, took John up to heaven to show him what's there in heaven, 
and to showing what's going to happen on Earth during that time. We have a sneak peek of future event. And for what purpose? A, to comfort the believer of that which he will not take part of in that which he will be part of. B, it's to cause the believer to feel the urgency of the times and share those things with the non-believers. You have to understand something. Um, when the people are left behind, they're so brainwashed. The last thing they're probably going to do is run to read Revelation and, and, and do this. Of course, there will be several, there will be salvations. Uh, we know that, you know, the 144,000 will, will minister. And we know that there are people who are known as the saints of the tribulation. But all in all, we, we see that the, for the, the vast majority of the people on earth will reject God by then. Um, and we need to understand that um, it is right now still the time for anyone who is not a believer to believe. The book of John was written and given to the church in order for the church not to keep it for itself, but to preach it and to use it as a warning sign to the believer to stay on track and to the non-believer to get home. And, um, and I do believe that um, this is our responsibility to be watchmen on the walls. And as I always say, watchmen's responsibility is to warn the people of that which is about to come. Now, if they choose to ignore, that's their problem. But if we choose to ignore, it is our problem. If we choose to ignore the task that we were received to share, then their blood is on our hands. And this is why I believe the book of Revelation is so important to us. And all the description, even of the tribulation, is super important. If only a remnant are awake and aware and watching for Jesus' re soon return, what does the Bible say about what happens to those who are sleeping, unaware, and or even mocking his return? It's a very good question. Um, all I know is that the crown of righteousness, which is the, the thing we long for, is, um, as, as Paul wrote to Timothy, the crown of righteousness is awaiting... Him who was about to finish the race. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, For my word, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. And I've, I've fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, um, I believe that in order to... I don't want to focus on those who do not love his appearing, who do not, who, who do not wish for him to come back. I prefer to look at the commandment for me to love his appearing and to long for his return. Um, God is the righteous judge, as, as Paul says, and he will judge righteously. So I, I'm not here to say what's going to happen to them. I'm here to say what is our job. Our job is to always remind ourselves of those things. The Bible the Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians, both at the end of chapter 4 and also in the middle of chapter 5, and therefore comfort one another with these words. The words of the rapture are words of comfort for us. The words of, of warning not to fall asleep as others do, and then that we're not destined to the wrath of God. These are words of comfort for us. So, these are the things we need to worry about. We don't have to worry about what is God going to do with the others. Let's worry about what 
is God demanding from us? If our preachers are not preaching the soon return of Jesus, or at least preaching the gospel, does that mean them false teachers? Well, a false teacher is someone who is teaching uh, false doctrine. And uh, my Bible talks about the return of the Lord. It's a promise that he gave to his disciples. If I go, I will come back and I will receive you to myself, to where I am, you will also be. That's his word. And of course, the words that he gave to the Thessalonians regarding the rapture of the church, the harpazo. And, um, and, and so anyone who's not teaching these things may ignore truth, but anyone who teaches the opposite is definitely, definitely a false teacher. Um, many Christians, particularly in Reformed theology, who believe that the church is spiritual Zion, use 1 Peter 2 as their primary defense, referring to us being living stones laid in Zion. What are your thoughts in counter to this? My thoughts in... I'm not going to counter... Bible verses. I'm just going to tell you that they were taken out of context because if you ignore Romans chapter 11, you ignore the heart of God. You know, in, in Romans chapter 11, Paul starts with this I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. In other words, God is not done with Israel. Yes, the believers, the Gentiles, have been grafted in. They are now partakers of the fatness of the oil of that olive tree known as Israel. However, they have not replaced Israel. They are now, they have joined Israel. They have been grafted in. That's what it's all about. And yes, those who once were not his people are now his people. And those who once without hope are now with hope. And yes, the Gentile believers are now kingdom of priests. Yes, I have no problem with that. Welcome to the family. But I have a problem with someone who think that God is done with Israel. I mean, if you, want, if you want to understand the heart of God for Israel, look at what Paul writes in the ninth chapter of Romans. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, and I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Paul never give us those so many assurances. Like, it's a triple assurance. First of all, I tell you the truth then I'm not lying, and the Holy Spirit is bearing witness here uh, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. And in chapter 10, he says, Brethren, my heart desire, my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. If it was the end of Israel, if the church has replaced Israel, then why would Paul go in every place that goes around Asia Minor, Minor and, and, and also in Greece and Rome, first to the synagogue? His heart was for the Jewish people. And that's why he even wrote, it has the power upon salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Um, and in in the book of Acts, he tells the people of Israel, I shared with you the gospel first, for it is right to do so. That's how it should be. Now, if God is done with them, why would we share with them? Now, Paul, in his under great understanding, wrote in, 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 in the, the 11th chapter, um, um, he wrote, So what then Israel has not obtained what is 
what it seeks, uh, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap. But then he says, and I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the world. And their failure reaches to the Gentiles. If it's so, how much more their fullness is going to be. So the Bible is not talking about God is done with them. The Bible says God has blinded them. And thank God he did that. So the nations will have the chance to accept him as well. Um, what do you think are the events described in Isaiah 16 prophecy about Moab related to? I believe that Isaiah 16 is a, a, an interesting description of the last three and a half years of the tribulation when the mountains of Moab will shelter the people of Israel from the horrors of the Antichrist. It's very interesting because in Isaiah 16, the Hebrew word is Sela, and the Sela in the Greek is Petra. So that's what a lot of uh, scholars believe that it could be that Petra is one of the major sites where Jews will find shelter during the time of the tribulation. Would you be willing to do a teaching on more detailed look at Zechariah 12 through 14? Yes, I'm working on it. And um, I'll be gladly sharing that with you when the time comes. Uh, Zechariah 12 and 13 and 14 are amazing chapters that are describing um, the final war before the return of Christ on earth, the war that some of you re refers to as Armageddon, but of course Armageddon is not exactly a war, it's a gathering place according to Revelation 16.16. 16. But yes, it is an amazing chapter. It's the chapters that speaks of how the Jewish people will lift up their eyes and see the one whom they pierced, and they will mourn and cry and repent. And that national salvation of Israel, as recorded in Romans chapter 11, the Bible says in Romans 11, um, the following thing, it says, um, in regards to Israel, um, in verse 25, for I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles has come in and so all israel will be saved so the bible gives us a great description of a national salvation of israel the only nation on planet earth that will encounter national salvation but that comes at the end of the tribulation when they understand that they've been wrong the whole time that when they see the one whom they pierced and they will mourn and cry as a token of great repentance and so that's Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 goes in details to the war and the return of Christ physically with his feet standing on Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives split and the valley and, and the river of life will, will go halfway to the west and half to the east and then amazing things. Then, then of course those nations that will survive the tribulation will have to come every year to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. How can we say that God is done with Israel when, when the nations eventually will have to come to Jerusalem to celebrate, not Easter, without any egg hunt? It's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, Jesus will st sit there on the throne of David and he will tabernacle among his people. So these were the questions um, that were sent to me. One other question that people asked me privately on Facebook, I think it was, uh, do you think that the Antichrist is Jewish? Um, it, does he have to be a Jew? And I'm telling people, I always tell people, there is no place in the Bible that says that the Antichrist is Jewish. Not at all. If anything, when Daniel describes in chapter 9 uh, 
the person. Um, it is in continuation to the Roman Empire to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. So um, it doesn't talk about Israel destroying Israel or a Jew destroying Israel. Now, I know that there is the passage about it does not regard um, women and or the God of his fathers. But 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 you have to you have to understand if, if, if it was a Jewish person, the ruler of the whole world, why would he want to destroy Israel? And another thing is um, um, another thing is uh, why would um, uh, why would um, it want say in the Bible that he is of a specific tribe? Um, that's why I'm 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 very skeptical about this whole Antichrist must be Jewish. Um, this is for me not anything that has to happen at all. Actually, um, guys, I am going to ask you now to write your question. I, I might take one or two questions um, online. Um, I know people think he's an Arab, people think he's a Syrian, people... Guys, Daniel talks about a specific person who will come from a specific alliance of nations. And it will be some of the same that destroyed Jerusalem. And so it has to be very clear that um, he, uh, you know, there's a great possibility that he will come from the resurrected Roman Empire from Western Europe. Um, so, okay, let's see. Does the feast point to a pre-tree rapture? The feasts of Israel are actually, um, in a way, not mentioning tribulation. The, it's all about the salvation plan of God, of the world and of Israel. So uh, we passed the springtime holidays and, and we're about to have the, um, the fall holidays that start with the trumpets and we're awaiting the last trumpet and continues with, and the trumpet is of course, going to give us the last one where we're gone. And then the Day of Atonement is when Israel is a mourning over um, the, um, you know, they, they will understand and they will cry and they will repent over their missing the Messiah. And of course, that tabernacles is when he is celebrating with us. Um, in the thousand years millennial kingdom. That's the only festival that the world will be demanded to celebrate. So the, the tribulation is not there. But remember, Israel will mourn. And the whole repentance is the fruit of the tribulation. Uh, uh, and that is represented in the Day of Atonement. Um, should Christians celebrate the feast days? Guys, the problem is that so many Christians are so much into legalism and so much into Judaism and so much into religiosity that they miss out the whole point that, you know, the Bible says that, you know, do not judge anyone for food or for drink or Sabbath or new moon or festivals. These are just the shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. So as long as you understand that all of them were pointing at Jesus and you're not becoming religious, then it's fine. Then it's beautiful. Then I think that these are biblical holidays and I think you better quit using the name Easter and, and call it the resurrection or the first fruits. And I think that you should, um, you know, you should commemorate those holidays and remember and remind yourself of all the biblical significance of them in light of Jesus, such as Passover. Um, but I don't see why you would be demanded to celebrate something um, um, when Christ is not in the center. So, uh, you know, if he's in the center, 
yes, by no means, go ahead and do that. Um, I actually support that 100%. But so many Christians are immature and they fall into religiosity. And Jesus condemned religiosity. You know, can you imagine that the religious people accuse Jesus for breaking the Sabbath? Jesus, God in the flesh, who wrote the Word of God, He is the Word of God, was accused for breaking the Word of God. So, do you understand that if anybody is wrong, it's the rabbinical establishment and not the Word of God? So, so who are you going to, and how are you going to celebrate things according to rabbinical or according to what? I say, remember that Jesus is the center of all the things. And if you remember that, if he's your center every day, and certainly during um, your celebration of, of things, then it's fine. Then it's okay. But I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you, the Gentiles, must keep the Sabbath, must do this, must do that, must stay away from... No. I remember when I first read uh, the book of Acts, um, chapter 15. You, you, you know that in the book of Acts, the disciples at that time, for the most part Jewish people, were presented with the same issue. What are we going to tell the Gentiles? Are they in any need to keep the law? I mean, what's going to happen to them? And so, uh, so the Bible uh, says basically... Um, that um, and I'm reading from from the book of Acts chapter 15. Uh, they had to conclude that there has to be something there, and so the Bible says. The Bible says um, that they decided. They decided in verse 28 and 29. For it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you. To greater bur uh, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. And if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So, if anything, these are the things that Jews or Gentiles must stay away from. But... Um, there was absolutely, the Bible says, I, um, I judge that we should not trouble those from amongst the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled. And by the way, sexual immorality, let me explain something. Um, I know that immediately people will think about uh, being unfaithful or same sex and all of that, but but you have to understand something. In the mindset of Gentiles who lived in cities such as Corinth, there used to be temples, and in the temples there were prostitutes, and people used to sleep with them and and have sexual relationship with the prostitute in the flesh, and they thought that there is the physical world which we have no problem being one with them and the spiritual world which we have no problem being one with Christ they didn't understand the that you cannot separate the two um, that our body the physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and therefore therefore when the Bible talks about sexual immorality is way beyond the things we know now it's things that were done publicly and were accepted and they were part of the lifestyle of the pagan worship of those days. So that's what he, they were fighting in those days. They were fighting those type of things of, of tell them that, yes, they're Gentiles, but they cannot, they cannot separate the physical and do that and then the spiritual and be here with us. They have to stay away from those things as well. Um, Guys, um, I think that um, I answered uh, quite a few questions today. Um, we're going to try and do that more often. Um, 
I, I enjoy those things, really. Um, thank you again for staying with us. Um, <laughs> can you share with us your diet tips? <laughs> uh, no, I, I just started a, what's known as intermittent uh, fasting, which is uh, eating in a window of eight hours and fasting for 16 hours. Um, the only the only issue now is what time of the day will that eating window should be. I originally started by having breakfast and lunch uh, within those uh, eight hours and then fast the rest of the days, uh, the rest of the hours of the day. But uh, I was convinced by more than one person that it's actually breakfast that we need to stay away from to continue that which the body goes through the night longer until noon and then start eating for the first time. So I'm working on that change. But again, it's it's wonderful. I sleep better, I function better, and uh, miraculously my headaches subsided to maybe once every other week and not five times a week. So this is uh, this is very, very good. It's not diet, by the way. You eat whatever you want. You just have to pace yourself in ways that you give your body at least 16 hours of fasting so it can just work on things and not be overloaded. That's all. It's not a diet. It's not what you eat. It's when you eat. And that's it. Uh, thank you again for uh, everything. And um, God bless you. And uh, we're going to stay in touch. I will keep you updated should something happen. Um, and um, I'm, I'm having two weeks at home right now to work hard on studying and preparing messages for my upcoming um, trip to Turkey and Greece where I'm going to shoot videos of teachings, of Bible studies on location in different parts such as um, Ephesus and Izmir and Pergamon in Istanbul, which was, of course, at the time Byzantium in Cappadocia. And then, of course, we're going to fly to Greece and we're going to do also Athens and Corinth and Thessaloniki. It is, it's going to be fun to teach first and second Thessalonians while being in Thessaloniki. So looking forward to that and uh, thank you again for everything. God bless you and Shalom from um, Galilee. Um, as we approach Passover, I'm going to either give a live teaching or I'm going to post Jesus in the Passover. It's a message that I gave, um, a message that I did a presentation, a Passover presentation on the stage at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills a couple of years ago, even with Marty Getz singing a couple songs in Hebrew. So thank you again, and God bless you. Shalom and good night from Galilee, from Israel. Bye-bye.